Avatar The Last Airbender is easily one of the best animated shows ever made, a show that could balance beautifully choreographed fight scenes and light-hearted comedy with child soldiers and genocide. With its success came the opportunity to broaden their horizons and delve into licensed video game territory. Avatar The Last Airbender open bracket game close bracket is an action adventure video game set in the world of The Last Airbender. There's a bunch of different versions of this game. The flagship version was developed by THQ, Studio Australia, a subsidiary of the late great THQ that focused primarily on Nickelodeon licensed games. Their previous works were SpongeBob SquarePants, Lights, Camera, Pants, and The Adventures of Jimmy Neutron, Boy Genius, colon, Attack of the Twonkies. Yeah, veterans. There is a DS version made by channel favorites Tashi Software, which is more or less the same game, but made for DS hardware. Where it gets weird is the PC version, which had a different developer, AWE Games. This version is completely different and follows the show's story beat for beat. It's very 2006 PC game with a lot of pointing and clicking. It is weird though how they rather make a whole ass new game rather than port an existing one to PC. The flagship version also had some variations between consoles. The Wii version was a launch title and used motion controls for attacking, and had an additional mini-game that used the Wii pointer for calligraphy. The version I played was the PS2 version, which didn't. The game starts off with the gong hanging out with the Northern Water tribe after the events of Book 1. This game has its own unique story and characters, which was genuinely a surprise, especially how the story unfolds. But you also visit every key location from Season 1, which doesn't make sense because they could have just done the show. You get control of Ong, and wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait a minute, is this a f***ing RPG? Avatar The Last Airbender The Game is a 6 hour RPG with action adventure elements and the best menus I've ever seen. <laughs> The game's got character stats, gear of different rarity, and fetch quests of minor rewards. This feels like an MMO. Everything from the enemies to the combat to the backtracking for five of an item. Like I mentioned before, each character has different stats with different strengths. There's four playable characters for each of the four elements, air, water, earth, and Sokka. Ong is the all-rounder, Sokka deals the most damage by buffing himself, Tara heals and Haru is here. Yeah, no Toph in Season 1, so they had to call in Haru from that one episode to be the resident earthbender. You gain XP from fighting enemies, unlocking skill points, the game auto-levels you because it's for kids, but you can redistribute your skill points at any time in either basic or advanced attacks. Basic attacks are your standard button mash combo, while advanced moves are specific to the character like Katara who has a group heal, or Ong who has the one-hit kill, whirlwind of death. Advanced Advanced move use of chi rather than having a cooldown, which means there's really no point using anything but the most powerful ability. Other RPGs, for example Dragon Age, have abilities on cooldown, so during combat you're cycling through them. The more powerful ones have a longer cooldown, so you end up trying and using every ability you have. If all your abilities cost the same amount of currency, why bother with something less effective? Luckily, even if you put all your points into the whirlwind tree, you won't unlock the ability till the late game unless you grind for XP, which is remarkably easy. Enemies spawn whenever they aren't in this can be annoying when you're running up and down the same nature corridor again and again. The minute to minute combat is mainly attack for a bit, block, then attack again. The block makes you totally for as long as you hold it down. The attacks are kinda weak, enemies feel very bullet spongy cause you're kinda just waiting for them to die. When you need to do anything at all, you enter focus mode. Jumanji! The QTE fest which gets old real quick if there's dust in the way. Jumanji! A river we can't cross. Jumanji! The bridge is out. Jumanji! That was over the course of 5 minutes of gameplay. There is, however, another element, Momo mode. You can play as Momo and collect items only Momo can see. Every level has these. This is fine, the game barely uses it, but like, whatever. You get tutorialized and beat the crap out of a hundred wolves and the Fire Nation attacks. Again, led by Zuko who we never get to fight, and this battle ends with a brand new Fire Nation machine. Boss fights in this game are basically all the same. You wait for the boss to attack and you hit the giant glowing weak spot, repeat. The gong beat it and begin their new, much more important journey to find what's going on with the new machines. They arrive at this Earth Nation village overrun with the Fire Nation troops. Enter stealth mode. As long as stealth mode is active, you're basically invisible to the naked eye. There's no fail state, if you get caught, the gong can just run away until the next cutscene gets triggered. I mean, points for trying 
trying stealth. This level is kind of fun. You have to tail these two short Fire Nation soldiers and steal their uniforms. The boss fight at the end is one of the better ones. It's against a jailer who could have been Zuko. He moves around a lot compared to the giant static mechs you'll be fighting, but takes ages to let you hit him. The next area is another Earth Nation village, this time in a forest. The Earthbender training camp is under attack from evil machines, but there's simply no time. There's a domino mini game called Four Nations in this. Not the impossible stacked line of dominoes, but traditional number domino. You place matching tiles next to each other, the first to be unable to place their tiles loses. The problem here is that you can see your opponent's tiles, so I just end up playing the game in my head and putting down all the pieces and winning every time. At the start of every level, there's a bunch of merchants selling specific items, which comes back to bite us in a bit. Why not just have the one merchant that sells everything and crafts for you? Or just have every merchant sell everything and craft for you? It's just hard to find a specific merchant when you need them. Anyway, the machines are bothering the local spirit, who takes the form of a bear. Wait for it to attack, then attack. The spirit leads you to Omashu, home of Ong's friend. Boomy. Now because it's the Earth Nation city, the only enemies you'll be fighting are stray cats, which I thought was funny given Ong's peaceful ways. The gong needs some information from the Royal Library, which is off limits to outsiders. Cue some easily cheese stealth. You eavesdrop on some guards hiding in a tea shop, sneak through the library, and return to Boomy. Now something dumb happened. To progress farther, we need five hardened leather straps to give to the stable master. Okay. This is the first and only time the game has ever brought up materials or crafting. The only way to get around is to follow the convenient green arrow on the mini-map compass. However, I don't know if this was a glitch or by design, but conveniently, just for this quest, the green arrow disappears. Omashu is huge compared to other levels, and there's no local map. You're just supposed to wander until you find five leather straps, and once you do, simply acknowledge that you actually need five hardened leather straps. Now how do you get those? So, when you walk up to a merchant, they'll sell you something not useful, or they'll craft something for you you or they won't. Finding the specific merchant that crafts hardened leather straps, then locating the stable master was next to impossible and took ages. This is the last time they try anything like this and I wonder why. Afterwards, the Fire Nation attacks and Haru, who's only used to them being present, must fight 22 Fire Nation soldiers by himself. Now Haru has some weak ass rock throws even though they really should do more damage. I guess he's the tank, but without Katara's powerful healing and Ong's ability to defeat everyone by himself, this was a random difficulty spike. I just had to chip away at enemies out of their range. The gong regroup for probably the best boss fight in the game, the console. This keeps you on your toes. The console isn't a massive target, he moves around. What he also does is trap a bunch of you in Earth, forcing you to quick swap to whoever's free and really use everything you have. The journey brings you to a secret island, not on any map. They make their way through an Indiana Jones dungeon the only way they can. Jumanji! Here they meet the maker, Leanne, who is genuinely one of the coolest Avatar villains. The Fire Nation aren't behind the machines, it's actually Leanne, a non-bender who isn't gonna leave saving the world to some benders and the avatar. The machines are designed to replace benders and defeat the Fire Nation and like what? We didn't get non-bender rights till Korra. I, I genuinely didn't expect to find this in a licensed kids game. But anyway, you fight the prototype Dreadnought, which is a machine with the power over all four elements, excluding Sokka. Yen escapes and heads to the air temple to destroy every avatar statue. Ong is not pleased. There's a bit where he goes into the spirit world. This is just Momo mode, but with Ong. Eventually, they split up again. Ong goes to the air temple alone, while the rest defend the local village. This isn't a problem because Ong has the whirlwind of death. There's a boss fight against a similar tank thing, but it only does earth. The rest get captured and Ong has to rescue them after he defends the west, north, and east fields from attack. He frees them and finally runs into Zuko. Got ya. No! There's one last confrontation with Leanne who monologued for a bit and... It's not about winning, it's about balance. Can't you see that vendors have created four nations instead of one world? This division is why there is war. The only road to peace is to even the playing field. Are we the baddies? One final machine, which is the same machine. This time around, Ong has to enter the Avatar state, where all of his moves are supercharged. This was fun, but made the game even easier than it was. Leon is defeated, the gong fly off, and Zuko survived. Roll credits. I, I, I don't know how I feel about this. It's a case of their eyes being bigger than their stomachs. Their ambition got the better of them. It tried to be an RPG, but... RPGs are tens of hours long. You need that to take in the breath of world building and mechanics. The Avatar, the last airbender of the game, doesn't have that, which is why it's only five to six hours. The story is well written, all the voice actors return, but the animation is lacking and lets it down. I can commend the developers for not taking the easy route or the safest route, but that's about it. Given the limitations of time and money, they 
probably should have just stuck to the script and made something a bit more standard. There's some good bits. I've definitely played worse on this channel. I had fun most of the time, and as a massive Avatar The Last Airbender fan, there's a lot to love, but as a standalone game, it tries to do a bit of everything, but nothing particularly good. So it's actually quite modern in that sense. What? Bunny! Boo you! How's my oldest friend in the whole world? Your Majesty, this moment has played through my mind for... You're here for the play! Guards! Costumes! 